Hello, horror fans, and welcome to episode 37 of Funny Book Splatter, a horror comics podcast brought to you by HorrorTalk.com. I am your host, James Ferguson. This week's guest is Mina Elwell, the writer of Infernoc, a new series from Scout Comics that just debuted this week. It's a moody Lovecraftian miniseries that really gets under your skin. The comic follows Sam, a young girl starting a new job as an in-house nurse for an elderly man. Things start out a little weird at first, and only get stranger as the comic goes on, leading to some pretty crazy reveals in the first issue alone. Mina can be found online on Twitter at at Mina Elwell, and Infernoct can be found on Twitter at at Infernoct underscore comic, and on Facebook and Instagram at Infernoct. This week's episode is also brought to you by Mutant, the new horror film that follows Christina, a young reporter who struggles with anxiety, that discovers a virus that causes the infected to harm themselves in violent and sometimes fatal ways. As Christina's boss pressures her to scrap the story, she starts to see signs of the virus all around her. Now she must decide whether the real danger is out there or in her mind. If you're into body horror and social satire, this is the movie for you. Plus, if you're a fan of the kill screen from previous Funny Book Splatter guest Mike Garley, this will be right up your alley. I love how the wonders of modern technology have led to a whole new breed of horror story. It's pretty great. Anyway, the crowdfunding campaign for Mutiny launches today, October 20th, where your contribution can get you exclusive content, a pre-screening of the film, and even a walk-on role on set. You can join Mutiny on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Mutiny the Film to find out how you can get involved and help bring this project to life. In other news, some quick updates for you. My very first Funny Book Splatter guest, Dirk Manning, has just launched a Kickstarter campaign for Tales of Mystery Volume 4, Everything Burns. The campaign met its funding goal in under four hours and is already plowing through stretch goals. Dirk always over-delivers on his Kickstarter campaigns, including extra comics, prints, and more, so you're going to want to check that out. In other news, Heavenly Blues, also from Scout Comics, from previous guest Ben Kahn, has been optioned by 51 Minds to be turned into a feature film. As a reminder, Heavenly Blues is basically Ocean's Eleven in hell. This is some great news for Ben, and I can't wait to see how the movie turns out. That is it for the news and updates. Now let's dive right into episode 37 of Funny Book Splatter with my guest, Mina Elwell. So what I usually like to start with is... What would, what would be your uh, elevator pitch for your book? Uh, and, and I guess I should ask the pronunciation of that as well. Is it in- Infernoct? Yeah, you got it. Awesome. It's yeah. basically Inferno and Nocturnal. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, it's uh, smooshed together. <laughs> yeah, I like that you capitalized the N to be sure. Uh, there have been a couple times where <laughs> I was like scrolling through. I had written like the um, when I wrote the review, I saved my uh, my draft and in all lowercase, and I'm like, what is Inferno? Like, what is th- <laughs> what is that? And I'm like, oh yeah, Infernoct. Okay, that I should have capitalized it in my own uh, saving of the file. <laughs> oh yeah, if you if you Google us, it still wants it to be Inferno CT. Like, it asks you if that's what you meant. <laughs> oh yeah, like, do you mean Inferno? Like, Conn- Inferno, Connecticut? Like, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> holy shit, I just realized that could be a crazy other version of this book. <laughs> <laughs> that's the alternate universe version <laughs> the town ta- the town in connecticut that's always on fire <laughs> exactly yeah that, that's exactly what it is <laughs> all right so it's it's not about a town in connecticut that's always on fire so how would you describe infernoct well alternatively it is the town in upstate new york that's always plagued by monsters i don't know <laughs> i mean in that way in that way it kind of is that it's about a girl who's trying to get her life back together after being kind of screwed up in high school and she tries to get a job and initially she thinks she's going to take care of this old guy who doesn't have anyone in his life to take care of him and instead of being a de facto home care nurse she becomes a monster hunter. Yeah, it's a, it's quite a career turn, you know. It's a it's a yeah. nice pivot there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, I'm not saying it's a harder job because there may be nothing harder than elder care, but it is definitely a job with more chance of getting your mind rended. <laughs> yeah, just a, just a bit. And what I like with the with the first issue is how, like, you could tell from the jump that this is a weird house this is a weird job like right when right when she walks into the house it's like there's no one there giving her instructions she just finds a little (laughs) piece of paper with some weird notes written on it and it's like oh okay i guess this is what i'm supposed to do and then the old guy doesn't really say anything and that's it 
and it's like and not to mention all the weird shit that's all over the house but like that's that's the kind of stuff that i mean any normal person would probably turn around and go all right you know maybe i don't need this job but <laughs> it sounds well, you know when you're 17 and you walk into your first job and there's something really off and you're like i guess i'll just do it anyway yeah. or maybe that's just my first job experience <laughs> <laughs> well yeah maybe that well like if it is her first job then it's a matter of like well i guess this is what this job is uh you know if, to, if this is her first gig as a as an in-home care elderly care person maybe this is what all old people are like to her and sh- we just don't know yet <laughs> this, is just, this is just you know how people are <laughs> yeah and i like yeah i think that is a big part of it for sam because she she hasn't really had a lot of experience doing anything that was you know, like a real job or anything that would help her help her mom. And uh, so she's not going to give up right away, even though this is clearly a haunted house. You know, you walk right up to it and (laughs) it looms over. Yeah. And that's something I think is, is really quickly established about her as a character that like, you see like her, you see a little bit of her home life, a little bit of the town and then into this world. And it's like, yeah, she's just like, this is what it is. This is my life now. We don't get the full background of her yet or, or where she's coming from, and nor do you really need it in the way that you have it set up. But it's a matter of like, OK, how this is the situation she's in. So, yeah, she would accept these bizarre surroundings and this strange job and this weird guy. Yeah, that's I mean, that's something that Eli and I talked about a lot. Eli Powell, who's the co-creator, we really talked about who Sam was and how we wanted her to react to horrific things happening. Mm-hmm. And it was very important to us that she not be, you know, hello, walking into spooky, <laughs> spooky situation. It's funny because I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like I can think of six horror movies that has that exact, <laughs> yeah. exact scene in it. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's you know it's such a real human reaction to have, you know, where you walk into a spooky place. But you know that's not the protagonist that we wanted to have. Right. And it's a it's a very different person. Mm-hmm. Now the her um, what would you call, I don't know is it it's not a ward her patient um this this the older man who lives in here like there yeah. I, I don't want to spoil um some of the stuff about the book but it's easily like this is a weird uh, setup so like again just like from the situation alone like there's this one really creepy yet kind of beautiful shot of him just sitting alone in like a recliner chair with just a whole glow of all these lamps surrounding him. Um, and it's like, how, how can you tell me more about that, about this gentleman, I guess, without spoiling too much, or is that uh, something we want to hold off on? Yeah. Yeah. I can talk about it in vague, unsatisfying ways. <laughs> he's, um, he's somebody who likes Sam, but in a more extreme way has a past that he's trying to get away from. And, To the point where he can't take care of himself anymore. Mm -hmm. And that first set of instructions, which is, you know, never turn off all the lights and a few other things, is stuff that he needs. And his needs are different than someone who you would normally have to take care of in addition to those things, Mm -hmm. which is why he has to rely on somebody like Sam. Because Sam either doesn't know or doesn't care that those aren't typical needs. (laughs) So she's like, sure, I guess I'll keep the lights on for you at all times and be prepared for the horrific things that might happen to you. Yeah. And it's, it's, I like how it, you kind of settle all that in and then you start ripping off a band aid basically about like, oh, this is, all this stuff is connected, all this stuff is happening. And yeah, monsters, monsters are out here, deal with it. <laughs> you know, there's only so long that you want to wait for monsters. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> that's just. <laughs> That sounds like a great a great title for an autobiography, uh, kind of thing. There's only there's only so much you, so much you want to wait for monsters, you know. I mean, if I could frame an entire comic with just two people sitting in a car having a conversation, my first drafts are probably entirely that. <laughs> but I know Eli doesn't want to draw two people sitting in a car for 22 pages. I know you don't want to read that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's. I mean, look, there have been there have been comics that have done something along those lines, and but. Um, that that's certainly few and far between. I, I'm sure Brian Michael Bendis has done a couple of those in in his past, where it's just a whole lot of a whole lot of dialogue. But that's that's not you know much easier said than done. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you have to know the characters by that point. Yeah, you have to care care what they're talking about. 
Yeah, to go on then with that journey of like, you know, reaching the end and realizing, oh, they didn't they just sat there the whole time. They didn't actually move. Like it's a it's a Kevin Smith movie of of a comic book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think to have that work, you have to not realize that that's what happened in the comic. Yeah. Now, so you mentioned Eli uh, a few times, so and he's a co-creator of the book. So how how did yeah. you guys come together uh to work on this project? Well, I already had a basic concept in mind and Eli and I actually went to the same college school of visual arts mm-hmm. and we were in different departments, different years. So we didn't meet when we were there, but that's was kind of our initial connection. And uh, I just reached out to him with the idea. He was into it. And uh, we started coming up with more detailed concepts from there. And I feel like everything that I send him, he gives me a 10 times more interesting, creepier, weirder version of <laughs> to come back from. <laughs> Is exactly what I need. Yeah, that that also. Um, and we really. Yeah. No, I was just saying that also represents a good collaboration because if you could build on each other's um, storytelling, then it just becomes a, a better story overall. Absolutely, and I think that's been a really important thing for me as well because, you know, it, I've never written a comic before that's been out in the world. So having somebody like Eli, who has quite a few comics under his belt, is really great because. And he's so ready to take any <laughs> crazy panels that I throw at him. Um, but he also knows when he's like, you know, I, I don't know if this is going to flow properly. Let's take a look at this. And we really work on that stuff together. That's great. That's a yeah, true collaboration in that case. It is a collaborative medium. And it's it's so great to hear that it's like, no, we just we work together to make this. It's not just, you know, here's the script. Draw it, Art Monkey. Like you're you have, you have more <laughs> of a relationship there. Yeah. Definitely. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where we've met in person several times, but then we do almost everything online. He's the only person I know who I can text detailed conversations about what outfits I think characters might wear. And he's like, yeah, for sure. That is how her socks would have developed over the past five years. (laughs) Such such a specific detail that like not many people may notice, but it's if if they're wrong, it's going to drive you crazy. Exactly. Yeah, it really only matters to the two of us, but it really matters to the two of us. That's, so now, the what about the designs for um, like the 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 hunter we see in the beginning and some of the monsters that pop up? So were those things that you had in in your head, or were, were, did you just kind of ask Eli about them and then uh, let him come up with some crazy stuff? Those are the way that we tend to do design is that I send him a ton of photographs. And then he comes up with something based on that. So like that that Monster Hunter's design, I remember when I was sending him stuff, I sent him probably five different hats. Okay. <laughs> I was like, this hat needs to be ridiculous in size. And I remember there being, I don't know, like an anime hat and some high fashion hat and then the realistic version of it. And I was like, you give me something in this hat range. And then, of course, I don't know if, if you've seen the trauma reports, but from those, you know that that character is a crime scene cleanup technician mm-hmm. in his day job, <laughs> and opposed to his monster hunting hobby. So in that way, that kind of influenced the design because he has to have those coveralls. So a lot of it is, is me throwing a whole bunch of ideas at a board and then him creating something cohesive and interesting out of them. Yeah, I, I like that, though. You're using some real world... Real world um pieces though to establish it so it all kind of comes from things that you could see in everyday life which could add a, an element of realism to it yeah um our you <laughs> likes to joke that our, our monsters are bought with tools <laughs> um, <laughs> because we have this idea of this very sort of suburban and, and mundane world which is like i mean kind of, i live upstate though not quite as far upstate new york as where sam might be which is uh You know, it's quiet and it's beautiful here, but, you know, you never know (laughs) with our with our creatures and our characters that we're introducing to you. We wanted to have this idea of something below the surface, which is kind of my letter to folk horror, which we don't have the American folk horror in the same way. But, uh, yeah, it's it's that kind of original Wicker Man idea of there being something else. Mm hmm. Now, you said this is your, your first comic, so, um, well, I guess the first that's out there. Uh, so how, how what was that experience like or, or in, um, in actually putting pen to paper to, to write out your first script? And how long has this been in the works? 
Um, I want to say that we started working on it a little over a year ago because we we were announced by Scout at New York Comic Con last year. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it was that far back. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, neither did I. But <laughs> yeah, that's when we were announced. Uh, but we just went to pre-orders pretty recently. Um, and since then, we've just been working on it. But uh, the experience of writing it, I'm I'm trained as a screenwriter. And that's what I'm used to working in as mm-hmm. a format, which is similar enough in that you're providing the words and then someone else does the visuals. But I, I think the nice thing about comics for me is that you are really only writing to three other people. You know, there's the line artist and the colorist mm-hmm. and then the letterer. So my scripts are full of these little notes like, hey, think about this. Or when you're writing this, you know, consider these ideas, <laughs> which... If you're, you know, if you're writing a, a script that could be worked on by, you know, 25 to a thousand people, depending on the size of the crew, you can't really do that. It has to be understood by everyone. It yeah. has to be in a format. Yeah. So that's been an interesting thing for me. So would you, when you first thought of this idea, did you envision it as a, as a film instead? This was always a comic for me. I've always been a big comics fan. So I've, I've always thought about comics mm-hmm. thought about ideas for comics um basically i i was going to do a comic because because um my friend ac medina who did elasticator came to me one day and was like hey um you're doing a lot of work and no one is reading it because you're doing it for a long term and you should be putting work out there mm-hmm. uh because he's an inspirational guy <laughs> <laughs> so I had start, I started working on this project and the basically the inspiration for Infernoct was stuff that I love that I think other people love too. And uh, which m- might seem disturbing knowing the content. <laughs> of the com- <laughs> well, no, no, look, I look, I write for a horror site. So I, I know full well that there's a, there's plenty of so an exactly. audience out there for these, for this kind of stuff and um, of all, of all shapes and sizes. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you decide to work on a project that, like I said, you know, we started over a year ago. You're really deciding that a portion of your brain is going to belong to it every day mm-hmm. for from the time that you begin to the time that it is completely finished. Because, you know, when you're writing something, you're not just writing it when you're working on it, you're writing on it all the time. So it has to be something that you really love. It has to be something that you really care about. So there's a lot of themes in Infernox that are things that I think about anyway. That's really well said, and you know, because you're you're not just writing it when you're sitting in front of the computer and and typing. It's something that is rattling around in your head, or you could see something that reminds you of a scene or or triggers something and go, oh, well, that's that's how all those things tie together, and then you're kind of like just off and running. So that's yeah, it 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 stays with you for a really long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and you know, I think that uh, that might be how. You know, writers get on the wrong train and <laughs> yeah. end up missing their stop. But alternatively, I think that does, you know, prevent writer's block, which is the curse of, of some writers. Because mm-hmm. uh, if you're writing every day in your brain, <laughs> then when you sit down to write, you have a whole lot of ideas that you've been working on for a long time. True. Although you actually have to sit down to write. I think the the idea of, <laughs> of saying, oh, yeah, I have this idea. I'm not ready. Yet. I'm not ready. Or like, I'm still thinking about it. Like, no, you have to just mm-hmm. sit down and type something. It has yeah. to be something. Yeah, something has to come out because otherwise you're not you're not actually a writer yet until you actually like write that stuff down. So you're more of a thinker. Yeah, which is nice. And, <laughs> you know, there's certainly uh, places for that. But you know, if you want to, if if you have that kick in, or just write it down. Like that's that's it. And, and it's funny, like how many times I've seen uh, writers on Twitter or anything. They're like, well, how? What? Any advice on writing? And every, like universally, everyone's just says, just write. That's it. That's yeah. all you got to do. Like, don't just write and write as often as you possibly can. And that's it. That's all you have to do. If you want to be a better writer, write some more. That's it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And my father, Tristan Elwell, who's the colorist. Um, he also teaches at School of Visual Arts, and he always says that if you're going to be an artist, there's a certain number of 
bad drawings that you have to get out (laughs) before you can have any good drawings come out. And I think it's the same with writing. You have to write a certain number of bad stories before anything good is going to happen. Because that's the only way you're going to get better anyway and recognizing that, oh, well, this wasn't good, but I see why it wasn't good and how I can be better next time. So, you know, celebrate the fan fiction you wrote at age seven. Like, (laughs) (laughs) it's fine. You know, you had to have those ideas and you had to put that out there before you can write your your great thing that you've been thinking about. That's right. Yeah, I was I was going to ask uh you so you mentioned your father's the colors so I was going to ask like yeah cuz as it has the same last name um yeah. is this a family affair? So what was that like working working with your dad on a project? Yeah, that's been great. I mean, growing up in my house there's you know massive oil paintings on the wall. <laughs> so I've I've always loved that part and I've always been very connected to art and He's the one who introduced me to all the comics that I love. So it's pretty surreal to be working on a comic with him. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that has to be a great feeling if like if he introduced you to all this and now it's like, you know, years later to be able to sit down and and make a comic with him. Yeah. Yeah. This is his first comic. He's usually a traditional illustrator. Mm -hmm. He does book covers. And uh, so it's pretty cool to be like. Hey, let's let's make a comic together for the first time, <laughs> since we both love comics and really fun. Yeah, that's it. It also sounds like a great like a uh, bonding experience too. Um, so long as he's not like overbearing about it, like oh, I can't believe you wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think he's liked the scripts. I think he likes them. Um, I remember I I, um, I know issue two isn't uh, in the world yet, but I remember showing him the issue two script and <laughs> him going back and being like. Well, that was uh, disturbing. So, <laughs> Success. <laughs> it's like, it's like, yes, okay. <laughs> that's the feeling you're going for, right? So that that's fine. Genuine alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it wasn't anything where I was like, I have concerns about how I raised you. If this is what you're creating now, <laughs> right? Well, he did name me after a major character in Dracula, so I think he had to come in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like it's your fault. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> now i also wanted yeah. to ask you that the uh um, in the the description for for issue one of infernoct it, it, it makes some reference to to hp lovecraft was so was that something that was an influence on the book yeah it definitely is and i mean i think the the obvious answer to that is you know oh creatures that drain your sanity mm-hmm. but in a in a wider way we were thinking about the the void and uh that sort of existential dread that goes along with Lovecraft and uh, Thomas Ligotti, who I think is like a real successor in that area to Lovecraft Mm -hmm. is someone who I was also very influenced by. Well, are there there any particular works that stood out or or was like must reads for, for either Lovecraft or I'm sorry, is it Thomas Ligotti? Yeah. um, Well, Tales of a Dead Dreamer is like, you know, uh, the book of short stories there's a there's a, a very random short story, which I don't even want to mention here because it's such a direct reference. We we make a very specific reference to a Lovecraft short story in issue one, which I think Lovecraft fans will pick up on. It's uh, <laughs> it's just a tribute to it. Mm-hmm. Which I think we'll enjoy. Yeah, I, I feel like I've circled Lovecraft forever and um like a bizarre game of double dutch and uh yeah. like I'm like am I going to go in here? I've read so much that he's been influ- like that he has influenced. Um yeah. but like in jumping into it, I just I haven't made the the plunge into some of his work as mm-hmm. well as I should. And and I might get like yelled. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get angry letters now. Like how could you not appreciate love? I'm like I'm, I appreciate <laughs> everything he's done for the genre, but I just like I haven't jumped into some of his work as well as I should have. Yeah, um, well, I read, I had one of those, you know, compendiums of short stories, you know, Cthulhu and other stories Mm -hmm. or whatever collection it was when I was a kid. And I really liked that. Um, And they're, they're a great collection. And especially when you're a kid and you've never read anything like that. And suddenly it's like indescribable horrors and (laughs) things that you (laughs) pull you into another dimension of terror. But I think, um, I mean, there's there's definitely things like if you're in the, you know, super fan Lovecraft group, then you know, there's things about it that feel 
uh, of the time mm-hmm. in that he was uh, and honestly like a little outdated of the time he was uh <laughs> he was kind of a racist <laughs> and it comes across in his work um but in a way that's what his work is about because his work is entirely about fear of anything different and mm-hmm. fear of you know being isolated and alone and that fear of you know other people and fear of people who weren't like him came across in these sweeping otherworldly ways and uh it really you know he really invited you into that mentality mm-hmm. yeah. and so these you know, i don't think it's like the only thing about his work that makes it terrifying because obviously there's a lot of things about his work that make it terrifying aside from his talent but it was definitely a big influence on me as a kid yeah it's 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 also a little eerie how similar some of those um themes resonate today uh with a lot of stuff that's going on the news now so it's it's hearing that and like i want like that can't be a conscious thing of (laughs) of some of this horrible stuff out there but uh yeah yeah it's something i'm gonna have to just take the plunge and and um dive into a lot of this stuff well a fair warning you know you may come across a (laughs) a story or two where someone is plunged into existential dread because they realize their lineage is impure but aside (laughs) from that (laughs) but aside from that it will be it will be excellent all right dom i'm definitely looking forward to it um you you had mentioned um, so that Scout had announced um, Infernoct at, at New York Comic Con last year. So, was yeah. how did you land at Scout as the ultimate uh, publisher for the book? Well, I ended up at Scout because of the people there. I was at Scout because, like I said, my friend AC is there, who did Elasticator, and uh, Michael Sanchez is there, who I met at, at Baltimore. He's he's their editorial director. And honestly, like you have a conversation with Michael and it's very hard not to <laughs> go, <laughs> go along with his plans because he's uh, he's like the full brains of every operation he's ever a part of. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Scout has been really great. They really have a, a nice tight ship over there. Yeah, they they have a night. They they had a whole the, the summer of Scout where they were announcing a a new book every week, and it it yeah. was some incredible stuff, some really awesome sounding horror stuff that I'm looking forward to. So it's, yeah, it's like I'm trying to think what else. There's Long Lost, right? That's horror as well. Yeah, and there's a well, Heavenly Blues, which I've I've talked with uh with Ben Con. Ben Con. Um, so he was a, a past guest on the show as well. Like I, it's also just like this. All of a sudden, this stable. I feel like it came out of nowhere. Where it's like, yeah, we're here, and here's like ten or fifteen different titles that are all popping up. Uh, yeah. That are all for for the most part up and coming creators like yourself that are out there, and and it's a kind of a little bit of everything. So there's there's a number of horror titles, but also just a little bit of everything in terms of the genres. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think scout is a good place for people to go. If they're looking for something that they haven't seen before, because there's something for everybody. Yeah. Uh, There's a really wide range of art styles. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really amazing. The, the types of content that they're having and the type of, of creators that are out there. It's, it's, uh, an impressive slate especially for an independent publisher like that to just suddenly come through and it's also funny i think when the when the summer of scout started it felt like they were like kind of lurking and searching through my own kickstarter history because i'm like hey, wait, I, <laughs> I backed that on kickstarter and then and then like uh, two weeks later i'm like i backed that one too like are they just going through my profile and finding <laughs> stuff so that's good to hear <laughs> or I'm glad there are things that people are interested in. Yeah. Or it means I have really good taste. Uh, hey, is also the case. That too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'll be very interested to see some of that stuff when it hits a, a wider release like that. I think it'll be a good, a good yeah. setup. Um, yeah, definitely. Now, so you had mentioned as well the uh, so your dad had gotten you into comics um, as mm-hmm. a kid. Is that what were some of your first titles that, um, that that stuck out oh man well sandman was the first series that i read religiously and told everyone about (laughs) (laughs) and was like a super fan and that's something that my dad introduced me to and he had introduced me to neil gaiman earlier with Coraline. Mm -hmm. so that's a great book to start with too yeah 
definitely. And there's a comic version of that too, but of course that wasn't out when I had started reading. Um, but so then I was interested in Sandman. And I definitely read that younger than the. the yeah, I was I was gonna say like that seems like an odd choice to start with, yeah, uh, yeah. but I mean, look, it's a fantastic comic, but uh, yeah. it seems like 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 how old well, were re- you when you were reading it? Oh man, um, definitely middle school. I mean, we'd read books before. I read like tons of of you know old black and white Spider Man and lots of Batman and you know all the. I really liked Jonah Hex. Mm-hmm. I still really like Jonah Hex. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all the good stuff. I read Asterix. It was like my first comic that I read as a kid, Asterix the Gaul. Mm-hmm. But the first series that I read, like, obsessively by myself was definitely Sandman. Well, you had such, like, a comic book pedigree to start with, <laughs> it seems. Like, you know, you, it's people, like, it takes them time to find things like Sandman, um, and then for you to just like right out of the gate, like that had to set such a high bar as well, because I know there's a lot of bad comics out there too. Yeah. Well, I was lucky enough to be finding comics like in my attic as opposed to <laughs> going places to get them. Yeah, that, um, that has to help if you already have like a, a curated uh, collection of sorts for you to sift yeah. through. Yeah, that does definitely help. It's like, oh, you want to read Watchmen? It's right up there, you know? <laughs> So it's funny, like, in, in I remember hearing stories about, like, my my dad would tell me, oh, yeah, I had all these comics, and my, my mom threw them out. And I'm like, did you have, did you have action, uh, you know, like, action comics number one? Did you have this? That, like, like, I'm like my, this was, like, years later. Like, my dad does not remember if he had a copy of, like, the first appearance of Spider-Man, nor would he know oh, that he had that anyway. But I'm like, that yeah. was all I, my mind immediately went to, of, like, obviously he had a treasure trove, <laughs> all the most valuable comics ever, and they're all gone. <laughs> but, but I feel like that was the, uh, you know, the old story about, oh, yeah, my mom threw out all my comics or something, but it's, it's it sounds like you know you yours was the opposite where it's like you're you had a collector in the family that yeah encouraged that and and pushed those along to check all these kind of books yeah. out. Yeah. I mean he definitely wasn't like you know he's not a a collector in the sense of getting them slabbed and, oh, yeah. and graded but you know he has he has some cool ones that that I've been reading and I have been reading since I was a kid which has been really nice. So is Sandman like your favorite comic or is that or, or is that up there as, as it sounds like it's up there as as a, as a definite favorite. But was that like the thing where you saw and you're like, oh, this is the medium for me? Yeah, I mean, I think and this is something this is something that I think is is an interesting thing for all creators. But I think I think Sandman was the first time, especially going along with Coraline, it was the first time that I went to find an author's work again, mm-hmm. which is kind of an interesting step for a writer because it's realizing that stories are created by a person as opposed to just existing in the abstract. Yeah. That's so that's a great point. Yeah. Cause that's something everyone kind of suddenly comes to grips with of like, Oh, someone makes this and someone gets paid to make this. Yeah. 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 And I always knew, you know, I mean, I always knew that because my, you know, my father is an artist and he works with, with authors, but having the idea of an author that I was really attached to their work and would seek out more of it and then having it be comics is definitely you know i think that's definitely important as a kid because then you have the idea like hey that is a job yeah (laughs) you can be this person and it's not a hobby and it is an actual career so did you always want to write growing up um i mean i think there's a million things that you want to do as a kid but i always (laughs) was writing you can find like literally hundreds of pages of very strange dark stories in my desk that I wrote in, you know, little kid handwriting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever I called what I wanted to do, I think there was always me writing at the same time. I think my first career choice was herpetologist. (laughs) Very specific. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I think I watched a lot of crocodile hunter. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, by the time, I mean, by the time I was like, I don't know, nine or 10, I knew I was going to be writing. 
That's great. That's like I love that. That's something that you know you established at a, such an early age, and then you stuck with it to the point where now you you're pub you're getting your comics published. Not even self publishing, but you're getting your your comics will be published by a a uh, a publisher. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's been a little surreal, but <laughs> pretty great. <laughs> Uh, so what about um, horror? So that that uh, was it Lovecraft as a kid that, and Sandman that kind of that got ushered you into the genre. Or were there any like uh, uh, movies or TV shows that stuck out as saying like, oh, well, this is this is something creepy and I like this. You know, I, I really love horror. I love all things horror. I like good horror. I like bad horror. <laughs> um, There's a place for them I both. think it's <laughs> exactly I think um, especially horror movies there's so much freedom in making horror films, especially because it's, it's easy for horror movies to get greenlit just because there's that, you know, base level of, you know, there's a certain amount of people who will go see any horror movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't don't say that with any judgment in that I am part of that group. (laughs) Um, So there's a lot of freedom in the horror genre. So maybe there's not a fantasy blockbuster every year but there is a horror blockbuster every year. Mm-hmm. So if you want to see the supernatural, you have to go see a horror movie, you know, and sometimes there's a sci-fi blockbuster. Like right now we're going through a superhero renaissance on TV and movies. And there is more sci-fi because we're getting both Star Trek and Star Wars in the movie theaters. And I don't know how we made that happen, but <laughs> if you wanted sci-fi before that, like a lot of the time, you know, you were seeing Alien. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, it's, you know, just our interests line up that way. And it's been that way forever. I mean, e- even dating back to, like, Universal and Hammer, just the the kinds of stories being told take place in all different periods of history and all different kinds of genres. And the thing that they have in common is that they're creepy. <sighs> Yeah, and well, and plus one other thing with with horror movies and why they're they're so easy to make is that they're cheap. They're very cheap to make, so mm-hmm. it's uh, you know, unless you're not getting a ton of special effects, a lot of it is practical and a lot of it is silly. So they're able to get yeah. away with it for cheap. And yeah, like that's what I think. What the Paranormal Activity franchise is like the most successful franchise sure. of all time because that first movie probably cost about twenty bucks to make, and it sure. made a ridiculous <laughs> amount of money. And it really invites you know, creative storytelling because, and I mean, creative filmmaking as well, because you have to tell a story using limited resources. If you want to make a cheap horror movie, even, you know, if it's an independent film, you can make an incredible horror movie. You just with a creepy idea. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of fans who will go see any horror movie. They won't like it Mm -hmm. if it's bad. But they'll give any horror movie a chance because the kind of horror movie fans are interested in strange things like The Witch is, you know, everybody speaks in that old time language. <laughs> it, you know, it's in one location. It would be so hard to get a movie like that made, except that it's a horror movie. Yeah, and I think the horror movie fan or horror fans in general, like they're they're rabid for that. They just, they want more and more and more. And that's what I, I, I found in, in reviewing as well is that like the, we get such a response from some stuff, it, especially if you find something that you've, that people ha- weren't aware of and they didn't, it's like, Oh, I have to go and check this out right away. Whether it's, even if the review is horrible, they're still going to go like, I, the premise sounds interesting enough that I have to go and check this out. And I think yeah. that says something to the, to the effect of the genre and what people, uh, love about it that's true and i think part of that is because what we're scared of or what we react to is so subjective that you know i could go see a horror movie and think it's terrible and you could go see it and love it because just what we're interested in in terms of fear could be different Mm -hmm. because do we really want to be scared by a horror movie or do we want to be affected by it do we want to be scared by it now or later you know that kind of thing you know, some people just love jump scares in their horror movies, and some people like me want deep existential dread, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think I think that's why, you know, horror fans, they like to read reviews, possibly more than any other group, because we're really interested in what other people have to say, 
But even if a review is bad, they're still like, okay, <laughs> maybe I'll like it. And and no one will disrespect someone if uh if they like something either. If it's like, oh, if if you thought yeah. that movie was horrible, well, but someone else loved it, they're not gonna you know shit all over it or something like that. It's like, I think it's telling in that like when I when I first started reviewing comics, it was just like on my own blog, and I got called retarded at least once a week. Where from some <laughs> random internet person, and I'm sure. happy to say, knock on wood, I've no one's ever called me retarded on horror talk. Like, and I say that hey. now, and of course, like next week, some asshole is gonna come in <laughs> and do it as <laughs> right, right. But right. Uh, like that would happen regularly, just from like generic comics, and I'm like, really, like you had to, you had to insult me because I liked Captain America once, and uh, <laughs> like like ten years ago, and then like really, but you know that this fandom is is much more inclusive it seems than than others in in terms of rallying about stuff and sharing different stuff because there's also like the there's like the underground effect with some of the things too because like there's there are still movies you can't find or movies you have to like really search for yeah and when you find them it's like it's like this hidden gem that you can't wait to watch and then share with other people to make sure that one's like a, it's a little bit of a bragging right so thing like oh yeah I, I saw this you have to see this too but yeah. the idea of sharing that is is something that speaks to uh, the horror fan, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's such an interesting group of people. I don't even know if it could be a fandom because it's an entire genre, but I feel like it is. It's it's like a horror community at any point. Like any horror convention I've ever gone to has been diverse and interesting and ready to check anything out. And honestly so enthusiastic the comics community is also incredibly enthusiastic but in a different way the comics community i feel like knows what they're looking for and the horror community i think is very open which you know is great too because the comics community i feel like is people who are super fans and they're looking for exactly what they want which is fantastic if your comic is what they want because (laughs) they already know before like i've had people who are all the way down the aisle see the banner and they're like oh yeah that's that's what i read and they come check it out i'm like how did you know i've i've had that experience at at comic cons myself and i'm just like okay i'm looking for horror stuff i'm looking for horror stuff and then like i'll see the banner or see see an image or the or the book itself on the on the table and go oh i know like this is it we got a kindred spirit here we're good to go like i can there's so much i can tell from some of that and and, but it is a really interesting intersection between these two fandoms between horror and comics and that you have one that's like super pumped and and will try almost anything and then you have one that's like a little more reserved and focused on just the stuff that they like and this weird kind of venn diagram that the middle is like this real sweet spot of like super focused fans or something and i think i mean part of it is the total saturation you know it's to be to read a comic that's like a mainstream comic you have to have started and read every book in the series and have followed it for so long that i think you have to be a dedicated super fan to be caught up um whereas horror there's there's less of that horror you can really shop around and and feel comfortable in any setting. You'd have to not be afraid of things. Yeah. But <laughs> You're welcome also, anywhere. And there's something for everyone in in horror comics, even because there there's there are mm-hmm. horrors that are just mind blowing gore fest, and then there's more ah. subversive stuff, and there's ones for kids, and there's comedy horror. There's yeah. really a little bit of everything there for people to. So if you if you like zombies, there's a bunch of zombie books. If you like vampires, there's a bunch mm-hmm. of those, and and you can find them in all shapes and sizes, all different types. So it's a nice um, intersection. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think that's something that's really great about the number of indie publishers that are out right now. And, of course, the number of books that are self-published is that if you're looking for something, it's probably in existence. Like, if you have one thing that you love, it's you can go get what you need. The The only thing is, you know, people finding their, their audience in their market. Yeah, and that's why yeah we we go through the whole thing about how important things like pre-ordering are, um, and if you like a book, you know, make sure to to sing its praises, share it around, and and talk to people about it because yeah. these kind of things live and die off of it. But the the indie scene is is fantastic for horror because 
in all honesty, the, the, the big two publishers, Marvel and DC, they don't really do horror well. They, they've dabbled in it here and there, but like I feel like every five years, Marvel remembers it has a slew of monster characters and tries to trot them out. <laughs> And then they just they, they sure do yeah they go away they they do like a mini series or a series that claims to be ongoing and then gets canceled after like seven issues and then it's gone and then it'll get tried on oh yeah remember Morbius the Living Vampire and Man Thing like we're they're back and they're they're fighting Punisher <laughs> isn't that crazy and then it'll go away again and it's it's something that they they don't really have a handle on it DC had a better handle during the New Fifty Two when they did Animal Man and Swamp Thing but. Oh yeah, that just yeah. kind of got pushed away after a little while, and it's because it's the same thing. It's like we don't know how to play with these toys, so they try them out for a little bit, and then they just put them back in the box. But all the other indie publishers just eat that up because there are so like I feel like almost every publisher, every indie publisher has at least a handful of horror books that they're they're publishing on a regular basis. So it, I mean, it makes my dance card pretty full, but it's something that it's like. <laughs> To see every week, like, there's another one, there's another one, all right, I have to look at this, I have to look at this, I have to reach out to this publisher because they're publishing books that, I, that I'm that i not aware of yet, and I need to get on this train. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, having, I mean, having sites that are specifically horror and having people talk about those books is honestly one of the main ways that people find out about them. Because it's it's hard to keep up. You know, if somebody wants to find this stuff, but they can't get to the horror conventions, you know, they don't have google alerts set you know yeah and it, it, I, it can sorry, be hard to keep up with that oh no go for no, it no i was gonna say like i also i also write for comiccon.com and i could tell you like yeah the the i i think the the stuff from the big two publishers gets more um it probably gets more insights and more people interested in it because they are so much so much popular almost more popular than some of the indie stuff but it's still that that have writing for horror talk as well and focusing on a, a lot more of the independent stuff i think gives more of an insight into them and outside of your traditional comic book site there because you're getting people that are interested in the genre and again you're kind of going back to that venn diagram analogy from it you're getting more of the folks on that one side that maybe aren't regular comic book readers but are really into horror and if they see something that catches their eye uh they'll they'll dive right into this book and not only this book but everything yeah but but a lot of yeah. Infernoc. That's what we're that's what we're talking about. So, <laughs> well, and I I fully believe that if somebody starts reading one horror comic, they're gonna want more comics. Like I think if once you get into the comic format, you're gonna love it. Yeah, it's something, and it's 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 also silly that um, you know, people that are like oh, I don't read comics, but it's like yeah, they're they're it's a medium. It's not a it's not just a thing. It's not or you only think they're superheroes or something. There's so much more to the genre than just capes and tights. So when, once people dip their toe in that sandbox, then it's like, or I'm mixing analogies, but um, more metaphors, but it's, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, once they get in there, then it's like, it's hard to get out. So it's something like it, it has to take a, a big change to get totally out of the, uh, the comic book world. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's funny that people think of comics as a genre. I mean, it's it's and so I have wrong, people. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's just it's so not that. I mean, in a way, it influences the way you tell a story. But there are so many different kinds of comics, and there are fast-paced comics, and there are slow-paced comics that I can't. <laughs> I couldn't nail down what it feels like to read a comic. Like that's not. It's not really a thing. Not any more than book is a genre <laughs> yeah that's that's the thing yeah is television a genre is movie a genre no it's just a, yes. a way to tell something so uh, so when yeah if you say i don't read a i don't read comics then it's like all right well i just don't read i don't watch television ever like do you see how how condescending and douchebaggery that sounds like <laughs> yeah. like i don't watch television i will shut up um i mean i think we do all know that guy but <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's like, it's immediately like I I know exactly who I'm talking about when I when I conjure that that uh, that image in my mind. <laughs> Unfortunately, but uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just stay away from that dude. I guess is uh the the moral of that story. So to to kind of wrap things up, so Infernoct is is it how long is it planned for? Is it an ongoing or a miniseries? At the moment, it is four issues. Okay, and, and the- it's a. Uh... It's a contained story within those four issues. And the first issue is scheduled to drop on October 25th. 
So that's um, right. And and uh, you know, I've already I've had a, the pleasure of reading the first issue and really dug it. So it's definitely worth checking out. I, I, you, you, I think you mentioned the word subversive before or something along the lines. Like I, that kind of horror that creeps in is uh, is often my favorite kind, especially in horror comics. And I think Infernoc does that very well. So um, I, um, I I sing its praises there. You could do jump scares, you could do a bunch of crazy gore, but I think the ones that yeah. get into your head a little bit and you could easily put yourself into the situation that the characters are seeing uh, becomes so much more effective and so much scarier as a result. I definitely agree. That's always what's been at least creepy to me. Um, and it, it definitely depends on who you are. I think of Infernoct as being very grounded and then occasionally dipping its toe into being surreal. Mm -hmm. Um, As you probably saw in issue one, there were a couple moments of that. And uh, yeah, I think as things go along, we'll see it get a little stranger. (laughs) Great. So we'll uh, look, I'll link up in the, in the show notes, the, well, one, the review to issue one, but also uh, links to buy the, buy the book. Um, online but otherwise where where can folks find you online well you can find us on facebook and you can find us on twitter and you can find us on instagram and our website should be live shortly within the next month or so and eli is actually going to be selling his originals on the website if that is the kind of thing that you are interested in oh the original artwork yeah oh, that's from cool. the series which um some of it will be living in my house, but the rest of it will, <laughs> you, you, you will be get available. First dibs. That's fine. I, I don't think anyone's <laughs> yeah. going to blame you for that. <laughs> but the rest, the rest should be available, um, which I think is going to be really cool. His originals are gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, the, some of the stuff in here it's just it's it sets such a great mood right off the bat. So um, yeah, I am jealous that you're going to be able to just uh, to grab some of that. Uh, uh, for yourself so good good for you though like you earned it so no one's like i said no oh, one's gonna fault you, you. <laughs> well if, if anyone else feels like having it live in their home our website <laughs> will go live soon <laughs> sounds good you know to freak you out every day yes nothing nothing says uh for, as i sit as i sit in my office uh surrounded by uh by by framed prints of of things that were too creepy deemed too creepy for me to put in the main <laughs> main part of the the house that they got Excellent. banished into the office <laughs> yeah so yeah there's Definitely alarming things living in my house right now. <laughs> so that uh, that about does it then for this episode of right. Funny Book Splatter. Uh, I have been James Ferguson, and with me this week, uh, Mina Elwell. Thank you. You've been listening to Funny Book Splatter, a horror comics podcast brought to you by HorrorTalk.com. We've been bringing you the best in horror since 2002. In addition to comics, we cover movies, TV shows, books, and video games. We've got news, reviews, guest features, interviews, unboxing videos, and much more. Be sure to sign up to Steve's Deals newsletter to increase your horror collection without breaking the bank. Check us out at HorrorTalk.com and at HorrorTalk on Twitter.